broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we're glad you're joining us today. Uh, my name is Stephen Peters. I'm the president of the American Military Partner Association. And today we are talking about all things education, uh, concerning education benefits for our military families. Um, we're glad you're joining us. So before we get started, I just wanted to remind everyone, if you are the partner or spouse of an LGBT service member or veteran, we wanna make sure that you are in our private online support network. Um, you can message us via our public Facebook page, which you can find us just at the American Military Partner Association and request to be added to our private online support network just for LGBT military partners and spouses. Uh, for today's webinar, uh, you can submit any questions you have via the questions panel uh, in the um, webinar presentation box. I'd like to go ahead and welcome our panelists. We're so excited to have Allison Hansen with us today. She is the Associate Director of Thomas Edison State College's Office of Military and Veteran Education. We also have uh, Bianca with us, and I'm, many of you know Bianca. She's the founder of the Military Spouse Education Initiative, and she is also an MPA organizational advocate. We also have Dr. Lori Hentick, our own Director of Educational Affairs. Uh, Lori is also an assistant professor at UC San Diego, and she teaches health policy for UC San Diego's medical programs. So without further ado, we, ado, we have a lot to cover today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Allison and she can begin the presentation. Allison, are you there? Allison, can you hear us? You might still be muted. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I That's okay. No problem. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and hand um, it over to you, Allison. Thank you so much for being here okay. with us today. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, like Stephen said, my name is Allison Hansen. I am an associate director of the Office of Military and Veteran Education at Thomas Edison State College. I'm also a Navy spouse. And uh, Bianca, are you? Yep, I'm muted. Uh, my, name is, my name is Bianca Strakowski. I'm a Marine Corps spouse. Um, I founded the Military Spouse Education Initiative in 2011 because of my own struggles with trying to finish college. I started college at the beginning of my husband's career about 13 years ago, and I'm still attending. Um, throughout my travels in the country, I came across many spouses who expressed problems in transferring credits, affording school, and finding quality child care. So there's, those are some of the issues I work on. We're going to go over um, solutions to those problems, but I want to also share that if you have any pro, uh, problems specific to your situation, feel free to email, email us anytime and we can work with you on navigating, fighting for your credits, or finding scholarships or grants for whatever school you're pursuing. Um, but basically, we are here to help you with any problem you encounter in trying to get to the end of your education. So here's an overview of what we're going to be going over today. Um, getting started, the basics, when, when you make the decision to go to school, it's a very expensive one. It's a time commitment required. It's a family commitment required. So we want to equip you with the tools to understand that you need to find a goal that you're passionate about. So when you get to those ugly days where going to school and juggling a deployment and kids and a job, when that starts to weigh heavy on you, that you have the right goal in mind so that it keeps pushing you to the end. We're also going to review the Service Members Opportunity College, SOC. Many people are unfamiliar with why this is a useful benefit. Um, it's specific to the military community. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that later on in slides. Understanding accreditation, another important topic. If you don't go to a school that's properly accredited, 
that piece of paper you earned is just going to be a piece of paper. CLEP and prior learning assessment. This is one of the benefits that I wish I would have known about early on. Um, we have a spouse success story um, later on in the webinar. A spouse was able to complete two semesters of college without even stepping foot in a classroom by utilizing CLEP. Federal financial aid. We have some updates to um, FAFSA, filing any of your paperwork with the repeal of DOMA. Then we'll review the benefits specific to you as a military spouse. And it's important to keep in mind as we go through each of these points, some of these benefits are also for service members, veterans, and dependent children. Allison will then review the post 9-11 GI Bill transferability. We'll go over some child care assistance programs, and then we'll get to your questions at the end. Before we get started, it is obvious probably each of you have a million questions as to what has changed now that DOMA is gone. Because this is a very evolving situation, we wanted to put the disclaimer up there that we at AMPA are working tirelessly to get in, in touch with all of the federal agencies to find out when you will get the benefits that you've earned and that you deserve. But it's important to note that this information is always changing. So some of the information included in here may have updates at later times, and Stephen will be sure to, to let all of our members know what those changes are. Getting started. Congratulations, you made a first step. You're here with us on this webinar today to pursue your educational goals. Whether you're just starting school for the first time or you're continuing on an education path you started some time ago, now that you'll be receiving a military ID card, there's a vast amount of resources and information available to you. I urge you to make sure you're researching all these topics ahead of time because many of the programs that exist can save you time and money when you're trying to pursue that degree. Where to begin? The very first important question is what do you want to study? What is your goal for yourself? Do you want a career? Do you want to take classes as a hobby? Are you unsure of what you want to do altogether? That the very first thing I would do is put to paper what is it you're trying to achieve for yourself. And then you need to decide, do you want to attend online or a brick and mortar school? The reason this is important is because this will limit the types of schools available for you to choose. If your life does not permit you to attend classes every day, then finding a properly accredited online school would be the best decision for you. When you sit down with an advisor, you need to forecast what your life is going to look like towards the end of semester, not just at registration day. Maybe your spouse is going to deploy sometimes throughout the semester. Maybe you're going to be transferring to new duty station. All of those things are very important to consider when you're deciding what it is that you want to do. Review the list of 1900 SOC schools. The reason SOC schools are important, I am stationed here at New River Air Station in Jacksonville, North Carolina. If I would have made the decision to go to a SOC school, when my husband got transferred to Yuma, Arizona, I wouldn't have had to worry about losing credits because my home school here at New River Air Station would have honored the education I was pursuing. We'll go into more details of SOC and why it's important to have a SOC agreement later on in the webinar. Check that the schools that you are interested in have proper accreditation. So you've figured out what you want to do. You've decided if it's going to be online or in person or a mixture of both. You found a quality school, well now you need to check the accreditation. Some people have spent thousands of dollars going to a college that once they then go to an employer for a job, they don't recognize the degree because the school that degree came from did not have the proper accreditation. Then it is important to meet with an advisor at your school. Don't think that you know all of the greatest aspects of the academic plan for yourself. Meet with these advisors, that's what they're there for. Um, also, figure out full-time schedule versus half-time schedule. I know for me personally, at the start of a semester, I'm very excited. So I load up the classes, and then halfway through the semester, I'm wondering, why did I do it this way? I've overwhelmed myself. I'm trying to do too many things at one time. 
and then it makes it harder to be successful. So make sure you put a lot of thought into what kind of course load you can handle. We're going to explore the various funding options. There are actually a lot of places to get scholarships and grants as a military spouse. We'll review filling out your FAFSA, the financial aid form. Um, that gives you access to things like student loans, uh, the Pell Grant, any private organization that does a scholarship will require you to fill out this form. And then you'll want to evaluate if you have prior learning that can count for credit. Like I mentioned in the beginning, I would have saved my time a lot, I would have saved myself a lot of time and money had I taken advantage of prior learning assessment, and Allison's going to talk about that later on. And now we'll go into the service member opportunity colleges that Bianca mentioned. Um, and, and like she said, uh, military families move a lot. So we want to make sure that your credits are able to come with you. Um, a, there's over 1,900 SOC schools. Um, and, and as she mentioned, these schools agree to accept transferability. Now, that doesn't mean that um, they, may, they may not transfer into the exact same, uh, de uh, not degree, subject matter. The courses may be different. So if you take a business course in one school, it may transfer in as a different business school. So there's no guarantee that it will be exactly the same. But it is a guarantee that they will accept transfer credit from, from the other schools. Um, they have typically, well, they have to have military friendly, I'm sorry, they have to be military friendly with flexible policies that allow service members and their families to complete degrees rather than just get credit. So they want to want you to complete a degree. Um, they also accept regionally, I'm sorry, nationally recognized tests such as CLEPS and DSSTs, which we'll talk about in, in just a bit. Um, and Within the Service Member Opportunity College Consortium, there's a smaller number of colleges that have agreed to accept certain courses that are the same at each college. And all of that information can be found at the website on, um, if you can see this presentation, there's a website there. I highly recommend looking at the list of schools, um, list of the, the degree network institutions, and just familiarize yourself with what they have to offer you. It's definitely a, a good place to look. Bianca? Now, when understanding accreditation, accreditation is a review of the quality of the programs you're getting. Uh, there are two different ways to look at accreditation. First, you're, you'll look at the accreditation of the school you're attending, and then you're going to look at the accreditation of the program. It is one of the most important items that you should research when you're choosing a school. If you don't attend a school with proper accreditation, when you move, which you most likely will if you love a service member, the value of your degree can be diminished. Uh, regional accreditation is the most important because it is the highest level a school can attain. Under regional accreditation, the institution has been certified as acceptable by one of the six nationally recognized accrediting organizations in the country. And down at the bottom of the slide, you'll see places where you can look. The Department of Education is one of the places you can check for regional accreditation. And then national accreditation is another level of accreditation awarded because some schools may not have met the stringent standards that regional accreditation requires. Something that is very frustrating to military spouses that I have encountered is that they will enroll in a school and then that school may lose its accreditation during that time. If you are enrolled at a school that loses its accreditation, once again, your degree is going to be worth nothing. So this is an important thing to pay attention to throughout the duration of time that you're attending the school. And all of these websites that we're including on these slides, we'll prepare a handout later on for Stephen to distribute to members. And now prior learning assessments. Uh, PLA, as they're also known, allow you to earn college credit for knowledge that you've already had, um, uh, job training, and it's a great way to earn credits before you even start a college. Um, a couple of different ways to earn them are uh, credit by examination, ACE evaluated employer training. Um, a, a great example of that is the military training, um, the joint service transcript, 
um, of your service member will have the list uh, on the right side of the ACE recommended credit. And the ACE is the American Council on Education, and they review and recommend credit for training. Um, there's also some certifications. Um, a great example are FAA certifications. Um, there are definitely others. That's a, a, a big one. Um, at least I see a lot um, in my work. Um, and there's an article uh, at the link on the website that you can read, and it has other examples and, and just a, a good breakdown. The credit by examination, CLEP and DSSTs, they are basically subject exams. So if you've ever heard of challenging a course, this, this is similar. Uh, that's, that's a different way to earn credit. But these are about $80 each, and you earn uh, three credits for each exam. Um, they're free for active duty reserves and National Guard. They're also free for spouses and civilian employees of the Air Force Reserve, Air National Guard, um, Sorry, I'm trying, uh, Army National Guard, Army Reserve, and Coast Guard, um, active in reserve. Uh, there are a lot of bases that have education centers, so you'll be able to uh, take your exams on base. Um, most bases may have limited hours, but it's, it's a great way to take these exams, and you, you get the score right away other than some of the, the exams that require a written part. Um, that, the websites are right there. You can get the, the listings of the subjects. You can also study for the exams, get practice exams. Um, a great way to prepare for these exams are um, the new, uh, well, they're not really new, the MOOCs, um, the, the, well, now I'm not going to be able to rem remember what that stands for. But they're online classes, uh, and they're free to take in, in most situations. You can just brush up on some subject matters. Um, then. Um, did I miss one? Yes. Um, exams offered by colleges. Um, these are also subject exams, except they're just offered through specific colleges. Thomas Edison State College offers TSEP exams, um, and Excelsior College offers ECE exams, and then UXL also by Excelsior College. Now, this is not necessarily a complete list. Um, you may come across another college or university that offers uh, these exams, this is just an example. And then we have the credit through employment experience. Um, the, like I mentioned before, the American Council of Education, ACE, awards and rec I'm sorry, recommends training, recommends create credits for training, such as military and professional. Um, you may also be able to build a portfolio of knowledge gained outside the classroom. Um, they're typically reviewed by professors, and certain number of credits may be awarded for um, the, the level of knowledge that you put together in your portfolio. If you go to the, the website that's linked, you can actually look to see um, if you're prior military, you'll be able to see what credit is awarded for um, rating and schools and um, depending on what branch, I'm sorry, your MOS. <laughs> um, and you'll also be able to look up on the employment side what some training, uh, on-the-job training, may award you in terms of ACE recommended credit. Federal financial aid, a very important question that was posed to us over the last couple of weeks is if you will qualify for in-state tuition. If you live at the duty station where your service member is stationed, under the Higher Education Act, they, that school has to give you in-state tuition. And you may go to colleges that will tell you a different answer. I would reference that on effective July 1st, 2009, public institutions of higher education must charge the in-state rate to the family members of the active duty military service members who are stationed there. So for example, here in North Carolina, UNC is a state school that we have. Uh, Same-sex marriage is not yet recognized in North Carolina. UNC has no choice but to provide spouses who are stationed here with their service members the in-state tuition rate. And this, this paragraph right here is direct from the Department of Education military liaison. When you hear things like, no, we will not do that, or no, you don't have a military ID card, so we're not recognizing that. 
Do not get discouraged. That is not the moment that you take that one person who told you that information and, and just give up. Don't give up. You have an entire organization here that is going to fight for you. And we're going to use the wor their own words and acts and, and things that have been passed legally to ensure that schools who are misinformed or employees of schools who are misinformed do not keep you from the benefits that you are entitled to. You are entitled to the same exact things that other military spouses are. Um, and you can, another important thing, always, always, always file your FAFSA with the Department of Education. Every year, this has to be done annually. States have different deadlines for this. Um, the website is there. This is the very first thing you have to do when it comes to financial aid. Once you have chosen your school and figured out where you're going and budgeted how many classes you can afford to take, your next step needs to be to fill this out. Anyone who's pursuing a degree that's a bachelor's degree is eligible for a Pell Grant. My husband, while on active duty, has been eligible for a Pell Grant. Um, regardless of what rank he got up to, I was eligible for about $1,500 per semester um, of the Pell Grant, which helped with my tuition costs. It's also helpful when you're pursuing student loans or grants through private organizations. Now this is the official guidance from the Department of Education regarding student aid programs. The Department of Education is reviewing the recent Supreme Court decision on DOMA and its impact on the federal student aid program. We will provide information and guidance on this matter as soon as it's available. And that seems to be the um, similar message that we're getting from federal agencies. But your life can't stop while people get their act together. So that's why it's important that if you have a situation that arises to you personally, that you contact AMPA and let us know, I went to the University of Florida and they told me I can't have X, Y, and Z. Those are the situations we need to know about so we know what we need to advocate and go to our contacts and ask for. If we don't know those things are happening, we can't resolve them for you. And Lori like posted to, a question. Oh, Oh, I thought um, it's just in the city of the duty station. So you're wherever the, the state that they're stationed in. Um, so let's say that I am living in Jacksonville. My service member is stationed at Fort Bragg. Any school within North Carolina has to give me the in-state rate because it's a federal act. It's not up to the state to decide. It's up to the, the federal government has decided you are eligible for the in-state rate. What it basically does is removes the residency requirements that most um, public colleges have for in-state tuition. So that's where that would play in. Um, it's also important to ask the college that you're interested in um, if spouses are awarded special military rates. A lot of colleges have different rates for military students that may be better than the in-state rate. So it's absolutely worth a call to the admissions office or financial aid or um, an information line to find out if they offer the, the military rate to spouses and see if that'd be something um, that you'd be able to take advantage of. Sorry. Now, if you, choo if you choose to live somewhere separate from your service member, so you're living in Texas and they're stationed in North Carolina, you can't get the Texas in-state rate unless you are a resident of Texas. The in-state tuition rate that I referenced only applies to military spouses who are currently where their service member is stationed. All right, my favorite section of this webinar is talking about education benefits specific to military spouses. And I would ask a favor of all of you that if we review something, and maybe it's not something you can use, that you pay that information forward. So. The first thing we're going to talk about is the MyCA My CA benefit, which is specific to rank. Um, if you don't fall within the rank guidelines, but you know an E2 spouse that might be interested, make sure you pay that information forward, because what we're finding is a lot of junior spouses do not know this program exists. Um, the My Career Advancement account, which I'll reference as MyCAA, was designed to help with portability. 
So we live a portable lifestyle. We, li we move very often. Um, according to the Military Child Education Coalition, we move every two to three years. So for the ranks of E1 to E5, W1 to W2, and O1 to O2, you are provided with a $4,000 tuition assistance benefit, the spouses are, um, only for the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps. The reason the Coast Guard is not eligible is because the Coast Guard does not fall under the Department of Defense. I do not know why these ranks were chosen, um, but it is used as a recruiting tool, so, so that might be one of the reasons. And they wanted to provide education career paths for the junior spouses. The catch is you have to be pursuing an associate's degree, a licensure, or a certification. Now, some people have been very creative with this, and they've attended a college that has four-year degrees and used the tuition assistance towards the first two years of that four-year degree. Um, most schools participate in this program, but if your school does not participate in this program, you can have them apply to, to be approved to fall under this program. It is a very easy process. Before my husband picked up E6, I used part of the benefit. Um, you go online, you do a long application, You'll see the link down below. When you put the link in, it's important to know that your uh, firewall or security set settings are going to ask you if you really want to proceed. I promise you it's a legit um, link. You then fill in all your information online. There are counselors through Military OneSource who can walk you through the whole process. If you do not know what college you want to go through, those counselors are there and they're paid to help you find a school that fits your needs. Um, but if you fall within those ranks, I am urging you to use this benefit. Because like most things we see, benefits are given and then they're taken away. And I don't know what the longevity of this program is going to be. Um, the way it's set up now has been in existence since 2010 when the rank structure changed. Um, but it's very valuable. $4,000 could cover an entire um, semester. It can cover an entire certification program. So if you wanted to become a personal trainer or um, licensed in child care, um, I've seen a whole array of very unique um, licensure programs for this. But again, if you have any questions about this, um, if you're unsure of the details of it, you are automatically approved for this as long as you're pursuing the correct program and you fall within those rank, uh, ranks that are listed there. Sorry. All right. Um, now we all know about spouse clubs. I don't know if Ashley's on the phone with us, but she helped to bring attention to two spouse clubs within our community. Throughout all military installations, there exist spouse clubs. Some are for just enlisted spouses. Some are for officer spouses. Some are for a combination. Um, annually, which usually happens in the beginning of the school year, the clubs open up scholarship scholarship programs for military spouses and children. The amounts vary that are offered per club. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a member of that club to apply. So I am not a member of a spouse club, but we have one here at Camp Lejeune. Um, all I would do is fill out a one-page application. Sometimes they require you to fill out an essay, and I could be awarded you know, a couple thousand dollars depending on how much they're giving out. It's a very easy thing easy money. If you apply for all of these things, including your federal financial aid paperwork, there is a good chance you're not going to pay anything for your education. Um, you have to apply at the club where you're stationed. So if you're at Fort Bragg, you can apply to Fort Hood Spouses Club. And, um, and like I said, the application period normally opens in January. I do have a list there of the Spouse Club scholarships and where they're located. I would research early on if your area has a local spouse club so you know what the different guidelines for application are. Another um, great source of financial aid is the uh, branch aid societies. Each of the five branches have one. Navy and Marine Corps is combined. Annually, they open up their application periods. Um, usually, those coincide with when the spouse clubs 
do, the Air Force Aid Society, the Army Emergency Relief, Coast Guard Mutual Assistance, and Navy Marine Corps Relief Society. Um, we will update in the AMPA group as these things come open, but again, um, it, it's an easy source of money. They'll give either grants, interest-free loans, or scholarships. Now we're going to talk about the post-911 GI Bill and transferability to uh, dependents. Um, the post-911 GI Bill was introduced in 2009, and it's absolutely the most common uh, veterans benefit program utilized by spouses and dependents. Um, there are some others, but this is the one that is, uh, I, I, I have to help people every day with this one. Um, Eligible service members have the option of transferring their benefit to their immediate family members. However, there's always rules. Um, for information about transferring, there is a website with a link right there um, on our presentation. And as, sorry, I'm trying to make sure I don't have extra stuff on my screen. Um, the transferability of the post 11 GI Bill and other benefits for same sex spouses, the VA general counsel is currently reviewing. I believe currently um, the VA works state by state, um, but they are reviewing that. Um, the post 11 to transfer, your, the service member must be eligible, um, I'm sorry, to transfer, your service member must be eligible for the post 11 GI Bill. Um, they, may, they must still be active duty um, or selected reserve. Um, the MGI bill, so that is the original GI bill, the one that's been in existence for, um, not forever, but it seems like forever, you must give up the GI bill in order to use the post-911 GI bill and transfer it. Um, the, the service member must also have at least six years of service, and they also must agree to an additional four years of service. Um, that is the, I, I don't want to say kicker, but you do have to commit to an additional four years um, from the date that the GI Bill is transferred. Um, again, the uh, VA's general counsel is reviewing all of this, um, and then we're back to Bianca with financial assistance. So aside from those branch aid societies and the spouses clubs, there are also private organizations whose mission is to serve service members, veterans, and military families who offer yearly scholarship programs. Um, I listed all the links here. Some of them are currently open right now. Um, the Council of College and Military Educators, they are accepting scholarship applications until October 1st. ACMEs, uh, they exist in 14 states. And if you log on to that link, you'll be able to find out if there's one in your state. Um, but one great example is Virginia has an ACME, and they do a yearly scholarship for veterans and spouses. The National Military Family Association does a yearly scholarship program. It opens December 1st. I actually um, was lucky enough to benefit from that scholarship this year. They give a $1,000 scholarship. All, all I had to do was answer questions and an essay. Veterans United, Hope for the Warriors, and Blue Star Families has a partnership with USC um, to help with mental, mental health care and social work degrees. Child care assistance. So one of those top three concerns military spouses express to me in how they can attain their degree is I can't afford child care or I can't find quality babysitters. When I was stationed on recruiting duty, we were in a civilian town and my child care costs were equivalent to my mortgage. So it was a matter of me putting my family in a financial bind or me not going to school. Luckily, there is a program through the Department of Defense. Again, it's for the four branches. The Coast Guard is not included in this benefit, but it's called NACRA. And they help give child care subsidies. Um, each one has different guidelines per branch, but if you are a spouse who is working, who is attending college, or who is doing both part-time, they will give you a monthly stipend it has to go towards a child care facility that has a high rating, 
and you can find out through their representatives if your child care center meets the guidelines. But my example, when I was on that recruiting duty, they paid $250 per child per month for the two, last two years of us on recruiting duty while I went to college. And the only catch was I had to be going to school. Um, and just as a side note, if you aren't enrolled in school, but you are employed or currently seeking employment, this program will also help pay your child care costs. Bitter City, um, you get free membership as a military family. They help you find babysitters or tutors who registered with them. This is another benefit provided to you by the Department of Defense. I helped find my son's tutor through this program. Um, and then child care grants. Some schools give you a grant to help with your child care costs or offer on-site child care programs. Other resources. Military OneSource is one that you're going to hear a lot about um, over the next coming months if you have not yet. Um, they're not only useful for education, they are everything. I wanted to learn how to garden. I called Military One Source. They researched for me how I plant azaleas, and they sent me an entire packet of information. Um, every duty station I've moved to, if I wanted to find out about good schools for my kids or a good college for myself or where to pursue career opportunities, they have counselors that are 24-7 there to help you understand um, any part of life that is happening. You're having a baby. You're looking to adopt. Um, if there is a benefit that exists for military families, these people know about it. So you can call them or vi visit their website. They have a Spouse Education and Career Opportunity Center. Um, Tutor.com. This is free for spouses of Army Active, Army Reserve, Army Guard, and spouses of Navy. Um, it's a free online tutoring program. It is not provided to the Marine Corps, Air Force, or Coast Guard. Most colleges and universities do provide free tutoring, though. Um, as far as the question from Lori regarding difference between active duty and reservists, um, all the programs that I've talked about, if you're active reserve, you're, you qualify for them. Um, I'd have to check which programs specifically are for other reservists, and I will get back to you on the answer to that question. Um, and then installation education centers. The installations have a paid person on each base who their job is to help you. Um, early on in my husband's career, I utilized the base education center. They told me about SOC. They helped me fill out my financial aid paperwork. They helped me figure out what schools were considered military friendly to attend. All of the resources we talked about are only valuable if you actually use them and they're there to make your life easier, they're there to make your decisions easier, and they're a benefit that you get for your, your service as a military spouse. So I would highly encourage you to use all of them. And I know this is a lot of information being thrown out at once. That's why we'll prepare some kind of a, a PDF handout that Stephen can distribute to members. And in summary, um, just to go over the items that we covered, uh, how to get started and choose the school, the degree, um, what direction you want to go in, um, why you should consider a SOC school. Again, there's over 1,900 schools that have agreed to accept transferability. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention was the SOC schools have also agreed to have a limited um, residency. Um, there's a certain percentage that they require um, the schools to, um, they have an agreement that they I think it's 25%. Uh, actually, I'm not even going to uh, guess because I don't remember right now. Um, but there is a percentage of residency that, are, that um, the SOC agreement requires. Um, understanding accreditation, as Bianca said, accreditation is very important. Um, I've had plenty of students who have credits from a, a nationally accredited school um, want to have those credits transferred into a regionally accredited school. And a lot of regionally accredited schools do not accept nationally accredited credits. So that student needs to start over. So just know what direction you wanted to go in. That, would, um, that ties directly into how to get started. Federal financial aid, FAFSA, is so important to fill out every year. Um, every July, um, it needs to be resubmitted. 
Um, the benefits specifically for military spouses, my CAA, the, um, the scholarships available, and then military one source is huge <laughs> for that as well. Uh, post 9-11 GI Bill, again, the VA is still discussing um, how, I, what they're going to do and when, um, but just know that that is an option for the post 9-11 GI Bill after six years of service and an additional four years of, of um, um, what I can't even think of the word, I apologize, of <laughs> guaranteeing four more years of service. Um, child care assistance and other resources. Um, NACRA is, is great. Um, they do have limitations um, as a Navy family. We applied when the base daycare was filled and my husband was on sea duty. Um, so those are the two I guess, caveats for NACRA and Sitter City. We also use Sitter City to find a nanny and it was great. Um, I highly recommend um, searching there. Um, and then other resources included uh, Military One Source, which has everything you could possibly want to know at your fingertips, literally. Um, I think we're going to open up for questions. Um, Stephen, do you want to jump back in to uh, tell us what we are going to do now? Or if I, I believe you can answer question or ask questions through the GoToWebinar section. So if people have questions, we can take some questions. Or Bianca, if you have anything else you would like to add? Um, just one of the important things I want to add, I um, we often see all these amazing things that our service members are accomplishing. They get professional training, um, a career path, they, their future is sort of paved for them. And many people get discouraged that it's impossible to achieve those things alongside their service member's career. I was one of those people who just felt, you know, he's always gone or we're always moving or financially it's hard to accomplish it. But if you, you need to set a goal for yourself. If you don't set a goal for yourself, this life is much harder to navigate. Um, you don't want to just watch the clock till you get to year 20 and then it's your turn to, to start making things happen. So that's why if you take advantage of all these different programs and resources, and rely on organizations like AMPA who, who want to fight for your, whatever it is, your employment goal, your, your um, education goal, to make your relationship better, whatever it might be. That's what we're here and we exist to do. Um, but the programs are only good if you use them. So I would love to hear what your goals are. Um, share them in the group or email us and let us know what you decide to do. If you decide you want to start a university in the fall to become a teacher or if you want to take a class to learn how to do ceramics, whatever it might be, I would love to, um, to hear the different things that you decide to pursue and to help you find the answers to any of the questions you might have. Thank you so much. Um, this is Stephen again. Um, so we do have some questions that have been submitted and for anybody that is online and has a question, uh, you can type it into the question box or you can raise your hand. There's a little icon that has a, a, a hand raising option. Um, the first question is from Kimberly Enos, and I apologize if I say your names incorrectly. Uh, she says, I am getting married next week in California, but we are stationed in Ohio. Uh, will I be able to get in-state tuition? Also, without using my wife's GI Bill, what options do I have for help with my education and paying for college? She followed up with that question by saying, um, my school, Clark State in Ohio, told me a few days ago that I cannot have in-state tuition, and that was that. What would I have to do to fight that? Um, Bianca, did you want to address that, or Allison, either one of you? Um, this is Bianca. One of the things I would say, um, if you have a representative you have dealt with that you can send to the email address listed at the end of this webinar, I can contact them personally. Um, I'd also it, encourage you to take 
what we posted is an actual the Higher Education Act from the Department of Education and inform this representative who is misinformed that you as a military spouse do qualify for in-state tuition because your service member is stationed in the state of Ohio. Um, I think I think we're going to have to educate a lot of people um, who are misinformed or who have not taken the time to understand because this isn't just an issue specific to same-sex military spouses. Military spouses as a whole tend to get the short end of the stick. A lot of people think because we're not the service member, we don't qualify for the similar things that our, our service members do. And it's going to be a learning lesson for a lot of people throughout this country that, that you are entitled to these things, that you will get them, and that you will not quietly go away um, until that happens. So I would ask you to send us the name of whoever you spoke to. Um, if you don't remember or don't have a contact, um, with your permission, I would gladly contact Clark State on your behalf and inform them of the information I received from the Department of Education in regards to that act. But, but don't take that, um, that one person's answer as the final answer because we have, we have the words of the act to protect you. Um, it isn't like I'm, I created it because that's how I want things to be. That is the actual federal guideline that we posted. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Shamia Briscoe. She says, how can my spouse apply for my CAA if she cannot enroll in DEERS until they recognize same-sex marriages? Um, Bianca, I'll let you go ahead and address that. Now, we are still waiting for, for the military ID card DEERS thing to happen. Um, I have my own questions as to why the DEERS enrollment can't happen now. Um, I told Stephen earlier on today that I am, was going to contact my contact at General Dempsey's office. He is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and find out what that timeline is because you do have to be enrolled in DEERS to use Military OneSource, but you don't need a Military ID card to use Military OneSource. Um, so I will get that answer and I will let Stephen know what the response was, um, but I'm taking down everything that is being fielded to us question-wise, and I will get you a response as soon as I get a response. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Judy Bishop. She says, does this all apply to retired officers as well? Um, no. Um, so question, spouses of retired officers, no. I don't know about the post-9-11 GI Bill. Allison can answer that. Um, the MyCAA program, uh, the spouses club sometimes are are for retired spouses, it depends on the spouse club because you have you are entitled to membership to a spouse club as a retired spouse. So you may be eligible for the spouse club um, scholarship. When we discussed the uh, branch aid societies, some of those depending on the branch do allow retired spouses to apply for that as well. Thank you. But the MyCA benefit is for current spouses. And with the Post 9-11, um, the service member must transfer while they're active duty. So um, once retired, there's no way to, to transfer those benefits. Thank you. Um, next question is a follow-up from Kimberly Enos. She says, uh, if we get sent out of the country, what are my options to continue my education? My wife is Air Force, and it is very possible we will be sent to Germany or Japan. Uh, I am a pre-nursing student. If we are overseas, what are my options that I do not have to put my education on hold again? Um, I can answer yeah. that one. Um, a lot of bases overseas do have colleges actually on base that offer classes. Um, the education offices on those overseas bases can also assist you in finding schools. Um, we mentioned those SOC schools um, that you can take classes with that can transfer into your program now. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's plenty of options. Uh, you would need to work with counselors with your current college to ask. You have to do a lot of research. So if you were to go overseas and say you need anatomy and physiology still, you would need to find a school, maybe online, uh, that you can transfer that a &P course into your current program. So you'll just want to talk speak with your counselors at your current college to make sure they'll accept the transfer credit. Don't ever take a class 
um, just assuming that it will transfer in. Um, it's, it's not a safe bet. Um, always speak to both colleges to make sure that they'll accept the transfer credit. Great, but it's thank definitely, you. you can do it. <laughs> Great, thank you. And just, just as an expanded answer to that, um, there are many colleges that have an MOU with the DOD. Um, so if, if they have an MOU, that is a school that whatever education you take there will will transfer back here into the United States. But I actually was received this question from someone a couple days ago. Her husband's getting stationed in Greece. If she goes to a Greek college for nursing, would her clinical transfer? And the answer is no. The clinical part, if she attends a university specific to Greece, would not transfer to United States requirements for nursing, especially since those vary by state. So I would pursue a college that has an MOU with the DOD and operates on one of those installations where you're getting stationed. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is from Krishanda Washington, and I believe she's on the phone, so I'm gonna unmute you, Krishanda. Um, just one moment. Krishanda, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for having this, first of all. Um, my question Hi. is, Hi. is the NACRA, I hope I'm saying it correctly, is the, the monthly stipend that you receive, is that based on um, the rank of the sponsor? Because I know like sometimes with DOD, some of the um, things that are available are only available for certain ranks. And my wife is a master sergeant, so sometimes, you know, senior enlisted ranks aren't eligible for some of the stipends and, you know, discounts that are available to some junior enlisted soldiers. Right. When we, right. Ut right. When we utilized the program, my husband was an E7 on recruiting duty, and I had an income. So it was my understanding that it was not based on rank. It was based on... Um, so if you're a recruiting duty family, if your service members deployed, if whatever your life circumstances, it, but as far as it went for the Marine Corps, um, it was not determined by our income. You do have to contact because each branch has different rules. Like if you are an Army family, the Army family gives you a lot more money than the Marine Corps does. So I would contact, um, are you Navy or Air Force? What, what is your branch? We are Army. Army, okay. The Army is much more generous with their programs because they have a bigger budget, so they probably actually give a higher stipend than the Marine Corps does. But um, I would call tomorrow, talk to the counselor who falls under the Army. Um, they're very helpful, and it's a very easy program to get started on. The application is lengthy, but it happened very quickly for me. But each branch has their own set of rules. But for the Marine Corps, it did not matter that he was considered senior enlisted. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next question is from Christy Woloski. Uh, I have a question, sorry if it's silly. There, don't worry, Kristen, there are no silly questions. Um, does my CAA cover individual classes at a community college or just certifications? It does cover uh, classes at a community college. Great. But you do need so to be enrolled if, in a degree program. So you wouldn't be able to just take um, classes without being enrolled in a degree that is um, um, a transferable career field. Uh, so you can't be enrolled in, say, a liberal arts or general you know, associate of arts or, or general education degree. It has to be a career field. So I think the next question kind of adds to that from Judy Bishop. She asks, uh, does, uh, does it apply for a, a hobby class? She said, in addition, just taking classes for a hobby, question mark. Allison, do you know um, that? You, um, if, so if, a, a student, or if someone wanted to just take, say, math for a hobby, no. Um, you would have to be enrolled as a student. So you could absolutely take classes just for fun, 
if you wanted to, but you do need to be enrolled in a degree program. Um, you need to send, when you apply for the benefits, you do need to send a degree plan in um, with the courses that are required to finish the degree. Um, so you can just take classes without, well, you need to be enrolled in the degree. Okay. I hope so, that answers the question. So one example, <laughs> because because I just looked that up, if I wanted to take a creative writing class, which goes towards an associate's Associate of Arts degree, that would be okay. They would pay for that, but you have to be, you have to have sat with an advisor and created an academic plan because they want to see that you're actually doing it for a reason. If you wanted to take ceramics to learn how to make ceramics, just because, no, that wouldn't fall under unless you're enrolled in the associate's program. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Anissa. And she says, uh, do the monetary benefits we've been informed about only apply to brick and mortar students as opposed to online students? Also, did you say GI transfer only applies to active duty, not retired? Um, the first part of the question, it applies to any schools where the benefits we have discussed today are for online or in person or a hybrid of both. Um, and then the post 9-11 GI Bill um, the way Alex, Allison explained it is the, the benefit has to be transferred before the service member retires. Okay. So you don't and necessarily have to use it until uh, you can use it after the retirement has happened, but it has to be transferred before the retirement happens. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Electra Thompson. Uh, thank you for the great info. My question is, previously my spouse and I have been filing single and or head of household. Do we now have to file joint on FAFSA to also qualify to use the spouse military education benefits? The way you file your taxes does not um, impact the education benefits we, we discuss. The only things I can see the way you're filing impact is if you're, you know, so my husband's income is taken into account when they're deciding how much of a Pell Grant I'm eligible for. Um, Allison, you might have more expanded information on this, but however you f are filing on your FAFSA does not impact if you can use my CAA or post 9-11 GI Bill or apply to a spouse's club. Bianca, did you have anything? To I add? don't really have additionally uh, any additional oh. information other than FAFSA would be income based, so um, that may have something to do with it, but I, I don't. I don't deal with FAFSA every day. <laughs> okay. Um, next question is from Desmond Hunter East. Uh, do you see any difficulty in obtaining educational benefits for binational couples? Allison. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to pull the I don't know card on this one. I, I really don't have a concrete answer. Um, so, I, so you're saying if you're I don't know. a... Um, if you're a citizen of Mexico and your service member is a citizen of the United States, would you qualify for these benefits? Yeah, I believe so. And I'm, a, that, I'm, going, okay. to un, I'm going to unmute you, Desmond, if you want to jump in here and maybe uh, add a little bit to your question. Desmond, are you there? Yes, I am. Great. Basically, um, I'm, in the pro I'm in the process of you know, getting my spouse sorted out for education um, with the fact that my spouse is British. It, I'm trying to figure out exactly what, how we go about and get him educational benefits. Okay, let me um, let me get you some answers on that, and I will get back to you no later than Wednesday. Stephen, do you have uh, their contact information? Yes, uh, I'm pretty sure I have you on uh, Facebook, Desmond. I will uh, make a note of that, and we will get back. Okay, I'll get back to you by Wednesday. And Desmond, if you don't mind, just shooting me that okay, question. Thank you very much. Desmond, if you don't mind just shooting me that question via Facebook as well, um, that way I, I remember can, to add, add that to get back to you. Okay, our next question is um, from Lauren Romano. Where can I find min more information about the Spouse to Teacher program? What expenses it covers and how long it takes? Um, the Spouse to Teacher program no longer exists. Um, once they created the MyCAA scholarship, they got rid of the Spouse to Teacher program because initially the MyCAA program was for all ranks. 
it wasn't until they realized they couldn't fund the program for all ranks that they they made the specific ranks. But the short answer is the spouses to teacher program does not exist anymore. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we have another question from Crescendo Washington. I just wanted to know if uh, NACCRRA is based on income of the sponsor and age of the children. Thanks. Um, not based on income, not sure. Uh, I don't believe the age of children um, impacted, except that the obviously I was using it for children who were not yet school aged. Um, if you're trying to find after school type programs, um, the Boys and Girls Club provided me with free membership. So my son went to after school care at a Boys and Girls Club every day here at Camp Lejeune for free. Um, so I, I need to know, are we talking about school age children or? Um, Krishan, I'm going to unmute you one more time. Let me find you in the list here. Krishinda, are you there? I'm there. Yeah, I think my question got to you kind of late. But, um, yeah, my kids are 11 and 14, and I was looking for before and after care. Um, okay. We do have um, a boys and girls club here, though, so I would definitely look into that. Yeah, they were yeah, great. They helped my, my kids with the um, homework, and um, they did fun activities with them. Um, as far as those school age, um, I'd have to double-check the answer of that because, obviously, we're talking about a smaller window of time that, that you would need child care in the day. Um, I don't believe there was any kind of age cutoff, um, you know, except once they get to 18. But I, I want to double check that so that I get you the correct information. And I can check on that by tomorrow. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Mar Maria Ramos. I saw something on the in-state tuition slide about continuous enrollment, even if your spouse is stationed elsewhere. Can you clarify what that means? Thank you. So if I started going to school here and um, my husband then got stationed in uh, Camp Pendleton and I stopped going to school, he's at Camp Pendleton, and then I decide I want to start going back to school again here in North Carolina. I can't get the in-state tu tuition rate because he has already left, he's not stationed here. But if I wouldn't have stopped going to school, I would have been eligible to continue getting the in-state rate. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Anissa, and I apologize if I said your name incorrectly. Um, my wife is not retired yet, and I'm wondering if there are still monetary benefits slash help if I take online courses and don't attend a brick and mortar school. Also, how does the child care assistance and tutor program work for my children that I had before my wife that she is currently caring for? Are, are the children considered are they stepchildren on the form? Like, are they under your wife's, um, well, paperwork as children, stepchildren? Anissa, I am unmuting you now. Are you there? She might have left us already. Um, Tutor.com is available for dependents of all branches, meaning children dependents. Um, not spouse dependence, even though spouses aren't dependents in my book, but that's another discussion for another day. Um, so any children can use tutor.com who are considered dependents, and stepchildren can be considered dependents, but they have to be, be declared on your service member's record that they are. And I don't know as much about that area as you might, Stephen, if that Okay. So um, if a same-sex couple, are they eligible to have had stepchildren on before the DEERS changes happen? Yes. Um, from what I understand, children um, of, that came into the relationship before the marriage will, will be eligible for coverage. Okay. So then I would say, I mean, any of the benefits we discussed, it doesn't have to be a biological child as long as um, you have them declared as stepchildren under your service member, any of the benefits that um, exist for kids could be utilized by your children. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is from Tatiana Farrell. So as far as transferring the 9-11 uh, GI Bill to a same-sex spouse, 
Uh, it is not yet approved, question mark. And then she says, and then do we know when that will be approved, if at all? And uh, Tatiana, I can go ahead and answer that. Basically, we're still waiting to find out from the Defense Department when um, these changes will take, take place. The only official word we've been given is six to 12 weeks uh, from the date of the court's decision, which was last month. We're coming up to the sixth week here this coming week. Um, we are hoping to get some kind of guidance from the Defense Department this coming week. Um, we'll see if we do get it or not. Uh, and of course, we will keep you all informed as soon as we do. So to answer your question, we, we don't have exact guidance yet, um, but we are hoping to receive that soon. Um, our next question is from Robert Cook. Thank you all for providing this valuable information. It is much appreciated. Most of the topics covered uh, today covered associate or bachelor level degrees. Would any of these apply towards a master's program for a spouse, E8 Navy personnel? I can um, answer that quickly. Um, there is definitely not as much available for master's level. Um, even filling out a, a FAFSA, the Pell Grant, I, I believe you have to be attending a certain I just applied for a master's program, so I've been kind of navigating this myself. I've not found a whole lot available for master's level. Um, most of the, I don't want, uh, well, attention is given to bachelors to, to help spouses and dependents get on their way to a career. Um, so that's my opinion. So I, uh, I've not found much. Uh, Bianca, I know there has been some questions on the website. Have you gotten any good information? Um, I have. So the private organizations that we listed information for, they are open up regardless of what level of education you're pursuing. The spouses clubs who do, do different um, scholarships and grants, they it doesn't matter what level of degrees you're attending there. Um, then there are other things external to the military, um, employer incentive programs, or if you pursue an association for your degree. So let's say I'm a human resources um, major. SHRM, um, S-H-R-M, is the association that's for my major. They do different scholarships uh, for master level degrees. I do have a link. Um, I can put it to the side questions of different scholarships and grants I put together for graduate levels. Um, of course, the post 9-11 GI Bill, that's for any level of education as well. Um, the only thing you're really not allowed to take advantage of is, is the MyCAA benefit is not for master's degree and the Pell Grant is not. But any of the other benefits we spoke about today, you can apply for for master's education. Great. Well, I think that is all the questions we have in our list. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. We have recorded this session, and so it will be available uh, in our private online support network afterward, as well as our website on our resources tab. Um, I believe, Bianca and Allison, you have one more slide for, the, for them? Um, oh, I did. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to scroll through. Everybody can get a quick recap of, of what we've done. Um, and I just, I just want to say one more time, um, again, we are here for you. There is no question that's too silly to ask. Um, being a military spouse myself, I really do consider my fellow spouses like family. So just as if my own sister would ask for anything from me, I would do the same for you. And I mean that. So um, please do not feel like you're asking too many questions or inquiring. If you need us to make phone calls for you or send emails or if you receive information and, and you don't quite understand what it means, um, let us help you because the best way to get through military life successfully is not to do it by yourself. So don't feel at any point like you're being a bother because um, it it really empowers me to be able to pass on the information that I wish someone would have given given me early on. Um, but you know, in recap, you're not alone in this. And as the coming weeks happen, 
and information keeps changing. As you encounter people who give you information that hinders whatever it is you're trying to achieve, come to us, use us. That's what we're here for. Great. Well, thank you all again so much for joining us. And thank you very much uh, to Bianca and Allison. We really appreciate you joining us today. Um, also, I want to let you all know that our uh, part two of our webinar series registration is now open for. So you can register for that. It's going to be on healthcare, which I know is going to be uh, in high demand. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions for that session as well. Uh, you can find the registration information on our uh, Facebook page, which is, again, uh, the American, American Military Partner Association, or you can find it on our website uh, on, at www.militarypartners.org slash events, and you can find the event listed um, there on that page and how to register for that. So uh, we hope you'll join us for that as well. And thank you again so much for joining us. You all have a great uh, rest of your, your day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.